Now we move on to the Visionary Awards, sponsored by Eagle Rock. And here to tell us more, guest presenter, Jerry Ewing. Jerry. Good evening. I hope you've all had a fantastic night. So, um, normally, I would get up. I would get up before Gavin and actually had some preamble before I introduced Gavin. Tonight, I've actually been given one of these for the very first time in three years, which is a cue card. On it, it says, uh, walk up to the stage, uh, announce the name of the warden's party. That's what Gavin does, announce, oh, announce my name. That's what you do. Uh, then it says, um, <coughs> read your speech. Now, the one thing that I said to myself before I left the office was, don't forget your speech. And the very last thing I did before I left the office to come down here today was forget my speech. So I'm afraid I'm going to be talking to you this evening a bit like my art editor Russell Fairbrother sings in the office with no real notes. <laughs> but um, right, I first saw this band, actually I first heard this band um, within about two years of coming to this country from Australia, so the early 80s. It was the Friday Rock Show and I heard this, uh, I didn't know what progressive music was at that point. And I heard this piece of music and it seemed to go on for about four weeks. Apparently it was about 16 minutes, but that's what it seemed to me at the time. And I thought, well, don't, don't think who's, 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 and who on earth would get into this sort of thing. And then um, about two years later, I was at Reading Festival. I'm sure there are people out here that were, anyone at Reading in 1983? Shut up, Travis and Rothery. I know you were there because you're on stage. But anyone else? Reading 83? Right, good. Reading 83, I saw this band Sunday afternoon and it absolutely blew my mind. Uh, they were unlike anything I'd ever seen before. Uh, and they remain pretty much like anything I'd ever seen or heard before. But uh, they are totally unique. And they are led by a visionary, quite frankly. We're talking about a man who had not the oh, most stable of upbringings, I guess, but who, whose creativity has just exploded over the years. Um, and I think it's, it's because the, the, the progressive rock world caters for people with such vision and talent that the, the, the person I'm talking about tonight has, has managed to create music. I mean, my God, they've been going 10 years when I first saw them, and that was 30 years ago, so 40 years of creating music. Before he was even in this band, he had not only gone to the Royal Academy of Music, I think he'd gone to the Royal College of Music as well. I think only, only Rick Wakeman's probably done that and a few more. Um, he was the orchestral arranger for uh, Barclay James Harvest in their early days, um, creating uh, a, a lush symphonic sound, which quite frankly has become the bedrock of a certain area of progressive music. Um, and then he formed the Enid, who remain one of those bizarre kind of wonderful bands that only the progressive world can really entertain. Um, they were amazing when I saw them in 1983. They went through some kind of lull and hi hiatus, but they're back with a vengeance with a pristine, young, sexy lineup um, and making some quite invigorating music these days. And it's an absolute joy to see this man back on stage and creating absolutely wonderful, far-reaching music that is truly groundbreaking and that people these days are, are really enjoying. I will admit, I did stand on stage once and call him the sexiest man on prog. I was, of course, drunk, that's me. But, uh, <laughs> but he is totally deserving of the Visionary Award. Ladies and gentlemen, please be upstanding for Mr. Robert John Godfrey of the Eagle. Well, I'm not going to stand here and give you some visionary homily. All I would say is that 
the Progressive Music Awards has gone from being a little spark of an idea to where we all are tonight. Now, that is because of the enthusiasm and the tremendous hard work of Jerry Ewing and his pals. <laughs> but the sad truth is that progressive music, which when I started as a young teenager, I saw it anyway, from my classical background at least, as being the bridge between the world of entertainment and the world of the arts, where this rather uncomfortable relationship could actually exist. And for a while, it actually did. I mean, the soundtrack of my life was the vanilla fudge, close to the edge, all those sort of things that really inflamed a whole nation. Um, times have changed, and those people who say, yeah, well, it's all over, we can never go back to that. Well, you can't go back to that. But the fact is, is that there's a young generation out there of very gifted composers and talented musicians who are not attracted to joining the progressive world. They're doing something else. Now, the future of progressive music, if we're going to have a life after death, because some of us are my age, you know, we haven't got long, um, we need really to invigorate the young generation. And the way to do that is that the heritage bands, the older bands, those who have a catalogue, and particularly those who are men and women of substance, should try and engage and involve the younger generation in their bands, very much in the same way that Frank Zappa did, actually, and give them the lead. Because us old men, you know, we can go out there and we can play the songs they all know. But um, really, the real burning fire of inventiveness, of wanting to succeed, is going to be with the young. So let's do our best to involve the younger generation and hand to them the very substantial musical skills that we in this room have acquired during the course of our lives by the hard work and graft and determination and commitment that we've given to our music. I take my hat off, which is why I've got to have to put it on first, to all of you. Yeah.